Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. In preparation for today's episode on teacher diversity, I took a trip down my educational memory lane. From kindergarten to my high school graduation, I only had four black male teachers. All of them taught me when I was in high school. That number doesn't seem like much, but in comparison to my peers, I was lucky. Some had one or none at all. How is the nation going to fill in those gaps? Well, here in Tennessee, the U.S. Department of Education recently awarded a $1.7 million grant to fund a study that will address the lack of teacher diversity in our schools. Later this hour, we'll talk with the lead researcher of the study and some educators about why teacher diversity is important and how to make it a reality. But first, it's time for At Us. Each week, we take time to read the comments so you don't have to. Yes, I am encouraging you to literally at us on Twitter at This Is Nashville, on Instagram at This Is Nashville underscore WPLN, and at WPLN News on Facebook. Joining me now with a look back at our past week is our executive producer, Andrea Tudhope. Hey, Andrea. Hey, Khalil. This is really exciting. You're behind the glass in the director's chair pretty much every day since, in, you know, the first six months. But now you're in the guest chair. Yes. And uh, the first time I was in the guest chair uh, was exactly six months ago today, which is uh, very exciting because that means this is Nashville is. Drum roll, please. <laughs> Six months old today. Yay. Congratulations. Isn't that wild? It's really wild. Yeah. Hmm. So if you were to guess, how many people do you think we've had on the show? 452. Okay. Not even. We have interviewed 700 people. And that is just the people that we interviewed in these guest chairs and um, for like, you know, the clips that we've aired. That's not even to include the people that we've pre-interviewed that never, that didn't make it onto the show. So... That's very exciting. That is a lot of people. It's a lot of people. That's really awesome. Okay, so what have our listeners been talking about this past week? So Facebook comments have started trickling in about a story we aired this week on the Sumner County Colored Agricultural Fair. Mm -hmm. It's gone by a few different names. A lot of people remember it as the Gallatin Fair, Um, but it was the first black-owned county fair in the country, and it started back in 1865 and opened every year till 1976. Um, Our producer, Rose Gilbert, went out to Gallatin last week and met up with a local historian and a few fairgoers. You know, it's a really great story. And if any of you missed it, definitely give it a listen. Yes. So on Facebook, a few people have been chiming in to share their memories of the fair. Uh, Visha Hawkins, who is someone we've interviewed for the show before, um, says she remembers going as a kid and says her grandma dressed to the nines. Um, We also heard from Marilyn Bryant, whose father, James Bryant, served on the fair board and kept the fair going through the 60s. She wrote, quote, as a child in the 60s, I would help him put up flyers all around the countryside. We had a snow cone stand at the foot of the steps of the grandstand. I love hearing those stories about the legacy of this really awesome fair. Yes. Also, a few people mentioned other black owned fairs like it. Um, Apparently there was one in Murfreesboro and there was a carnival here in Nashville. So I'm hoping we can look into that for future episodes. I'd love to go to a carnival. That'd be fun. Yes. You know? Okay. <laughs> so in other news, reporter Ambrio Crutchfield came on yesterday to catch us up on the mayor's East Bank redevelopment plan, which he unveiled last week. And we got a question on Twitter, right? Yes. Matthew Bond tweeted us at This Is Nashville and asked, what will happen to the Juvenile Justice Center? So for those who might not know, right now, the Davidson County uh, Juvenile Detention Center alongside the juvenile court is located right next to Nissan Stadium. Uh, Nissan Stadium. And to answer Matthew's question, the plan is to move the detention center to a new location near Brick Church Pike. OK, that's good. What, what else we got? So switching gears, uh, do you remember the episode we did on birds? Duh, yes. Yes, I know. Listen, we do a lot of episodes, so I just wanted to double check that you remember. That's good. 
Um, so for that episode, our former producer, Tasha A.F. Lemley, went on a quest to find the Purple Martins, which had been sort of evicted from their roost outside of the symphony. Mm-hmm. I remember. That was a great story. Yes. It was honestly one of my favorite features that I've gotten to edit since we launched. Truly delightful. Um, so spoiler alert, Tasha found the Purple Martins that night that she was out. But a few nights later, she went back and they were gone. And they're hard to miss. Like when they're roosting at night, it's like a tornado Mm -hmm. of birds. So um, we put out a call out to our listeners to write us if they spot any purple martins settling in at sunset. So imagine my delight when we got an email. This was like a month or more ago. Anyway, we got an email this week. Subject line. This is Nashville. I found where some of our purple martins are roosting. No way. Yes. Um, I just really love that our listener remembered that call out and was just like thinking of us when she looked up into the sky and saw the purple martins um so her name is valerie and she sent me a video which i'll share on social media um later here's how the roosting sounded from a distance Okay, so it's kind of hard to hear, but in the video, you can see this uh, loose tornado of birds just funneling uh, from many yards away into the into this tiny but tall chimney near Centennial Park. They just Hmm. like disappear down Hmm. the chimney. So is this case closed? I'm going to say no, because we found them before and then they disappeared. So listen, if you guys uh, spot any Purple Martins, let us know. Okay, please let us know. You heard her, y'all. If you spot any Purple Martins, let us know. Anything else? Yes, one last thing. I have a challenge for our listeners. Okay, I love a good challenge. Last week, we got out into the community and put up uh, like 25 This Is Nashville posters around town. Um, I'm not going to say where. So my challenge to our listeners is find our posters, snap a selfie while you're at it, and tweet us your photos at This Is Nashville or email them to thisisnashville at WPLN.org. That sounds like fun. Many thanks to our executive producer, Andrea Tudhope, for this roundup. Andrea, we'll see you on the other side of the glass in about, like, 60 seconds. Yeah, let me hustle. Okay, okay. Don't forget to add us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Let's keep the comments coming. Also, Fill out our community survey to let us know what topics you want us to cover at thisisnashville.org. It's super easy, very quick, and it helps us produce the shows with your needs and interests in mind. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll learn how a recently awarded grant from the U.S. Department of Education could help improve teacher diversity in our state. Did you have a diverse array of teachers growing up? Tweet us about it at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. It may come as no surprise to you that Tennessee teachers are overwhelmingly white. For 37% of students here in our state who are people of color, having a teacher who looks like them can establish connection, trust, and just overall enthusiasm for education. But with so few teachers of color, just 13%, not many get that chance. Well, last month, the U.S. Department of Education awarded a $1.7 million grant to the Tennessee Education Research Alliance to look into this system lack of diversity. Now, here to talk more about that grant and the studies lead is the studies lead researcher, Dr. Jason Grissom. He is a Patricia and Rhodes Hart Professor of Public Policy and Education at Vanderbilt's Peabody College and serves as faculty director for the Tennessee Education Research Alliance. Jason, welcome to This is Nashville. No, oh, thanks for having me. Really appreciate you being here. So first off, If you could, you know, tell me a little bit more about the scope of this grant. So the the point of the grant is to really dig into the pathway into teaching uh, uh, focused on teachers of color. So uh, we know, um, as you were as you were just pointing out in in Tennessee, we have an increasingly diversifying uh, student population. But the fraction of teachers in the state who are 
teachers of color has been pretty flat over the past 20 or 25 years. And so at the Tennessee Education Research Alliance, we've been studying uh, retention for a number of years, uh, diff- uh, how the retention of teachers of color uh, might vary relative to white teachers, um, but we've done less work on the pathway in. And so this is this new grant is really focused on on the recruitment side, thinking about all the way back to when people form aspirations to, I want to potentially become a teacher and track them through that pipeline, through their educator preparation experience, through getting a license, through looking for a job, through finding their way into their initial years in the classroom. We want to really map out what that pipeline looks like. We want to understand what people's experiences along that pipeline are. And then we want to look at what points along that pipeline teachers of color are diverting uh, from that pathway into the classroom. You know, I mentioned earlier that only 13 percent of teachers in Tennessee are people of color. So, you know, what else do we already know about the problem here? Well, as I said, we know that the uh, we know that that number hasn't changed uh, uh, over the last few decades, and research in other states has has pointed us in in some directions uh, that that we're going to be exploring uh, here in Tennessee with this new award. So, uh, as one example, uh, one of the steps that you that you need to pass uh, in order to become a licensed teacher in Tennessee is you need to pass the licensure exams in your subject area. And research in other states has suggested that the passage rates for those exams can be pretty different for white teacher candidates versus teacher candidates of color. And so we want to first look at Tennessee data and understand whether that that pattern is reflected here, but then also dig deeper and try to understand. Let me, let's, let's assume that Tennessee has a similar disparity to what has been seen in, in studies of other states' data. Try to understand well why that happens. Um, what is it? Is it what is it about uh, the preparation or support, for example, that teacher candidates are getting to be able to get past that licensure test barrier in order to continue along that pathway? So, the, you know, those are some of the directions that we're anticipating that we're uh, going to be taking this research as we move forward. Okay, I wanted to get. I want to ask you a little bit more about licensure a little bit later on in this segment. But let me ask: Have you started interviewing anyone yet? We have. So we've been doing a little bit of pilot work as we were ramping up uh, uh, in anticipation that we might uh, be successful in this particular competition. And we had some had some funding to begin doing some other kinds of work. And so we've been uh, interviewing HR directors across the state already um, and trying to understand from the point of view of the school district, what what are the challenges uh, that that folks are seeing on the ground in terms of trying to diversify the, the teaching workforce in their district. So what are the challenges and then what are the strategies that they are implementing to try to overcome those challenges? What about, uh, and it's been, I'm sorry, uh, continue. I was just going to say, I, I, it's been really interesting in talking to these folks because I think to a person, the HR directors really recognize the value of teacher diversity and are, are really anxious and eager to think about strategies that can help them with diversifying. But what they're saying is the pipeline is often not there. That uh, it's just really challenging to to find people to be able to recruit uh, to even consider for hiring uh, because uh, they, they're just not seeing uh, in many districts just not seeing the applications. What about people who work as people of color who work as administrators? I mean, do you see a similar disparity there? It's similar. It's similar. Uh, the leadership workforce in Tennessee is slightly more racially and ethnically diverse than the teacher workforce, but there's there's not a big difference. Uh, what's really interesting, though, is that that leaders of color seem to be an important part of the puzzle in terms of thinking about diversification of the teacher workforce. So in some of the research that we've done uh, in earlier years, we've seen that uh, black principals, for example, are more successful both in hiring black teachers into their schools and also in uh uh, ensuring that those black teachers, once they're hired, stay in that school over time. Uh, and so there seems to be this connection between school leadership and and teaching uh, that uh, is really something important for us to explore further. My next guest has been working to bring more teachers of color into the fold. Dr. Dyrese George is executive director of the Tennessee Educators of Color Alliance. Dr. George, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. We really appreciate it. So you know, what would you say are the key areas that must be addressed in order to create a more diverse teaching population here in Tennessee? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's, it depends on how you're attacking the pipeline. So I, when we look at the work, we look at it in the vein of pre-service educators, people who are trained to be teachers, 
uh, in service uh, educators, and then also folks who are in leadership roles. And so those things could look a little bit different based on who you're talking about. I'll take it with the pre-service. Pre-service teachers of color, teacher candidates, people who are trained to be teachers. Uh, some of the things that that one of the most important things is, is that there are some explicit challenges that are associated with being a teacher of color uh, in a classroom, in a building uh, that just aren't embedded in your preparation program. Many of the teacher candidates of color that we've supported are going through racial isolation in their program. So they're one of a small few of people of color in their programs. And oftentimes, uh, what they're learning doesn't prepare them for the realities that they're going to face. So many times what they're learning doesn't prepare them that they may take a job when they graduate, regardless of semester that they graduate, and they may be racially isolated in the building that they go in. They may be put in a position where they have to take on additional duties. They may be put in a position where they take on the most challenging students with the most challenging needs consistently. Uh, if they're multilingual, they may be in a position where they have to translate everything or be asked to translate everything. So a lot of times those things aren't embedded in their preparation. And we understand that we lose our uh, the majority of our uh, early career teachers of color in years one to three. And so without that preparation, uh, without those things being embedded in the preparation, that's extremely challenging. So we got to reshape and retool how we prepare teacher candidates of color um, for preparation. And that also includes how we prepare them for licensure exams and also uh, the ed TPA. Um, unfortunately, if you're a person of color and you're going into a preparation program at a traditional uh, institution, most of the time, if you don't have a high enough ACT score coming out of high school, you have to take what's called the core praxis. The core praxis tests you on math, reading, and writing. Well, unfortunately, for, especially for black and brown students coming from the state of Tennessee, Math and, and reading are two of the areas that most teach, uh, students of color in the K-12 space have scored significantly lower than their other counterparts over the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're asking them to, to, to pass tests on areas where K-12 unfortunately hasn't allowed them to be successful academically or from a growth standpoint in comparison to other subgroups. That's one thing with teacher candidates and with, with folks who are already in the profession, it's again, the same things. The We have to address racial isolation and racial aggression that people experience in schools across the state. I, I, I kind of um, want to talk about that. I want to talk about people yeah. who are already in the profession because, you know, what about teacher retention? The pandemic, you know, was tough on a lot of teachers. And in many respects, a lot of them are still recovering from the experience of the pandemic. Absolutely. You know, and some have left the profession for other opportunities. So how can we better retain teachers of color when their presence is so important for students? Yeah, I, I think that you're spot on when you say that um, folks, there are some folks right now in real time that are um, that are recovering from burnout from the pandemic. Um, my wife is being one of them. She actually stepped away from a little bit because the reality of having to teach in person and teach virtually and being evaluated in a virtual capacity where, you know, your administrators didn't have to teach in that capacity, in addition to being fearful of you know, potentially catching COVID and literally watching two teachers in neighboring schools who passed from it was a huge issue. Everybody knows that COVID hit black and brown communities a little more immensely uh, in comparison to some other communities. So that that's a real thing. I think in addition to that, though, um, as people are recovering, we have to start thinking about folks who are who, who, who are still committed to the profession. And for many of them, you know, the removal of some of these additional responsibilities uh, as disciplinarians, as being the folks who have to have overstaff classrooms, being in positions and situations where you're you're constantly having to uh, cover classrooms uh, because you know of, of the student demographic and the challenges that they may face. Um, access to leadership opportunities, whether that's department chair, being able to sit on a council, a school leadership team, not even formal administrative role, but just the 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 the, the um, elevation of being able to say that you're contributing in a way. Um, and then what does recognition look like, uh, especially if you're in spaces and in places where you're constantly having to do the most with the least? Uh, there's a myriad of things that we can think about when it comes to retention uh, that's even beyond money. You know, I know money is always the, the, the hot topic, but there are some people that are committed to this profession and they're well aware what they're going to get paid. There's not a district in the state of Tennessee that doesn't produce them and, and and make available um, the salary that you're going to make. So there's yeah. there's plenty of people who are aware of that, and they know that it's other things that they're lacking. Uh, and I will say the other thing I will say is we have a lot of people who are navigating, especially since COVID, uh, the pandemic, um, on uh, teacher waivers. You know, they still haven't passed a licensure exam or a TPA uh, assessment, and they're in fear of losing their jobs 
because they don't have the support either to help them pass it in or the resources to financially um, pay for. You know, I know folks who have had to take some of these assessments upwards to 10, 11 times. And so when you have someone who's great for kids and this is a barrier for them to be able to be sustained in the profession, you're going to lose someone who who's raising their hand and say, I would actually do the job if I had the supports necessary for, to have me sustainable to uh, sustain to be able to do it. So again, it's a it's a wide range of things. Um, I'm only highlighting a few, but it's, it's 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 something that we need to dig a little deeper on. We're gonna look more to dig a little bit deeper in a minute. If you're just tuning in, this is Ka Nashville, and I'm your host Khalil Colonna. We're talking this hour about the lack of teacher diversity in Tennessee with Vanderbilt professor Dr. Jason Grissom and Dr. Dyrese George from the Tennessee Educators of Color Alliance. Now, Dr. Grissom, Dr. George was just mentioning some of the barriers. What are other barriers that you know, barriers to entry that people of color often experience when getting into education? Well, uh, I think they're one of the things that we see really starkly in the data are that teachers of color are tending to be hired into schools where, that have uh, markers of challenge. So teachers of color in Tennessee, like in, in a lot of states, are more likely to work in urban environments. They're more likely to work uh, to be hired into schools uh, that have higher concentrations of poverty, lower achievement, um, uh, larger numbers of, of students of color. And those are, uh, we don't, what we don't know is um, how much of that is driven by the commitment of people of color to work with uh, student populations that are, you know, have these markers of historical disadvantage. I'm sure that's part of part of it. Uh, part of it is what jobs are open uh, to people and how how educators are sorted uh, through the system in recruitment and hiring decisions. So that's part of a little bit of what we hope to learn. But what it points out is that uh, being hired into um, a position uh, that uh, you know has low achievement that tends to be correlated with other things like uh, challenges with parental involvement or uh, challenges with student discipline. Uh, just really means that those those extra challenges that ju that that just means that educators of color are dealing with extra challenges also uh, that may not be coming with the additional kinds of supports uh, that that Dyrese was just talking about, uh, and that can be a real barrier to holding on to people uh, beyond uh, just you know the first or second year in the profession. You know, from my personal experience as a teacher, I found it difficult to balance my work and the need for my presence on campus as the only black male teacher. You know, sometimes, as uh, Dr. George mentioned, you know, we're asked to take on additional roles. And, you know, I, I really want to get more into that a little bit, Dr. George. When you're talking with the teachers that you're working with, what are some of the additional roles that they're taking on and how does that really affect their enthusiasm for the job? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, you mentioned something, Khalil, that I can absolutely relate to. Um, I, so from a personal experience, but then also so from teachers that we support, uh, from a personal experience, you know, I, I was the only black male teacher in the building that I taught in for a handful of years. Um, and so for me, and, and to be clear, I had a phenomenal experience at the school that I had, but the, the realities that associated with that was, you know, um, all the things that we hear about, particularly when, we, when we're talking about male educators of color and black male teachers being a disciplinarian, when there's problems with black and brown children, particularly males, uh, they were sent my way without question. The number of students that I had transitioned to my classroom without even a heads up, you know, and I taught in the high school, you know, kids were just transferred to my classroom. So giving up lunch breaks, giving up time where you could be doing lesson planning or being supportive of other students to address a disciplinary issue, particularly with black and brown children. Um, as a male, you know, everybody just assumed that you could coach any sport been asked to coach multiple sports and, and be a uh, ambassador for multiple clubs was a thing. Um, being in a space where, you know, sometimes people were insensitive to, you know, the my lived experience. Um, I, you know, I'm the only person that walks in the building and has the lived experience of a black man. Uh, and people not being as sensitive to that in many spaces that I had to navigate, uh, not only within the building, but also throughout the district. Uh, those are real things. And just like with students' academic identities, they can't divorce their racial identity the same way teachers of color can't do the same thing either. So a lot of what I experienced in the district that I grew up in is the same when I taught in showed up in the classroom too as well because I was trying to right some of the wrongs that were done to me but many regards I didn't realize it until I was actually sitting in a classroom and realized like hey some of the same things that were happening then are absolutely happening now um you know I'd like think, to, I'd like to hear from both of you on what 
would bring more people of color to choose to become teachers in the first place? Jason, what are your thoughts? I think this is the, really the $64,000 question. I mean, we see that we see in general that fewer people are choosing teaching as a profession over time. I mean, the numbers of people who are going into teacher preparation is declining. Um, and so that's, that's the first order problem that we have to, we have to solve that. Then we have to think about, well, what are the differential barriers, uh, for people of color, uh, to, to go, uh, to make the investment, to go into preparation that will then lead, uh, towards, uh, towards becoming a teacher and how there might be particular barriers, uh, for that population, uh, relative to, to white teacher candidates that are making up sort of the overwhelming, uh, set of people that are, that are going through that pipeline. Um, and, you know, a the how you get people to form aspirations, I think, is something that that lots of folks are thinking about. Like, how, how do you get people to be interested? So one of the, the strategies that has become, um, I think, has gotten a lot of attention recently is uh, what we refer to as grow your own kinds of programs um, where you can uh, which can take different forms. So uh, these are programs where you sort of recognize that you might have some talent or some potential talent that exists locally already, maybe even some folks that have expressed interest in education in a different way, um, who you might be able to attract into the teaching profession. So maybe you set up pathways for people to move from paraprofessional or teacher aides kinds of roles. Um, often people that are in paraprofessional roles in schools um, are a more racially and ethnically diverse population than the teachers are. Um, and maybe they're people who already have experience in schools who are already known by that school community. And maybe they are a population that could be tapped into um, that could uh, be brought into teaching and help diversify. Or maybe you focus your efforts um, on high school students. Um, high school students um, have lots of, have their whole lives ahead of them, right? In terms of thinking about what their interests might be. Do we need to have programs at high schools that are creating opportunities for high school students uh, to think about uh, potential in teaching and get them experience that can push them along that pathway into higher ed? So, I mean, you need multi-prong strategies, uh, but this this idea that we need to figure out how to help people in general and 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 people of color in particular uh, form those aspirations uh, for for moving into the classroom, I think is really really key. Dr. George, briefly, do you think that programs like Grown Your Own are enough? Uh, I think it's a start. Um, I personally worked at a, a space at, a, at the National Teacher Residency, which is a variation of Grow Your Own. And I think that some of the things that we're, we were doing in that space could absolutely be adopted in the traditional uh, education preparation programs. Uh, a couple of things very briefly, uh, the ability to be able to work and have access to income as you're navigating uh, preparation is extremely important. Many people, if they had to choose being able to support their families or pursue their aspirations uh, professionally, they would choose to support their family if it meant giving up what they really truly wanted to do. So the ability to be able to have access to um, um, income while you're training is extremely important. In traditional prep, right now, people are still training to be teachers and having the student teach without compensation um, for multiple months. Also, the ability to have access to mentors, sometimes will reflect your background, and then also being able to have access to this ideal around so the social justice and educational justice orientation and some of these grow your own programs like National Teacher Residency is extremely important because it now it puts the teacher as a decision maker in a solutions oriented position, as opposed to being able to work in a space where you're more, I think, complicit and sometimes adding additional, um, uh, adding on to the problems that already exist. You're now looking at them in lens through where you're looking to be um, um, solving them and actually at gaining, giving students access to better opportunities, both educationally, academically, uh, as opposed to burdening them with some of the same things that we've seen consistently over and over that just having work when we look at results in the end. Now, Dr. George, you mentioned earlier about the licensing process. And, you know, tell me, like, what are the factors that contribute to this problem? Because it seems that it's a deterrent for potential educators. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think some of the things, you know, some people are products of education and equity. And so I can honestly say when I worked at the National uh, Teacher Resident, I was the director of recruitment. Part of my strategy was recruiting people who were already working in the district and MNPS and then folks who, um, you know, were um, who I considered like staples in the community, people who had who were from Nashville, graduated from a high school and wanted to add, you know, wanted to give back into the community via teaching. All that to say, um, when we recruited people into the program, sometimes we didn't factor in the educational inequity they had that they had received or we had experienced from K-12 and even through college. So they still showed up to us 
with the gap that existed in math, science, reading, English, the same, some, some of those same core areas uh, that they needed to show themselves proficient in in order to be able to get a license to teach. Even though, you know, there were some people who could get a teaching waiver, teach kids, and at the end of the year show that they had um, growth or academic gains, they still needed that licensure exam. And so all that to say, you know, um, within that process, the barrier is, is that, um, we're requiring people to take uh, access to uh, have access to um, take exams to get licensure, but we're not providing the supports to make sure that they're fully licensed to, to, to keep their jobs. Um, and so if preparation programs know that they're going to admit people every year, uh, fall semester, spring semester, summer semester, and there are going to be people who will be accessing the, the campus or the program that necessarily probably don't have the right scores from an ACT perspective, and they may have to take the core practice, then that also means that they may be struggling on that content exam too as well. What are we going to do differently to make sure that those systems and structures are in place that way we don't lose them? Because one of the points that wasn't made earlier is that there have been multiple people who actually entered education preparation programs with the intent of being teachers, but they were pushed out because of these exams. And we don't know what that number is. We don't know how many people we're losing year over year. We talk so much about people who leave the profession, but there are people who are automatically saying like, hey, I want to be a teacher. But because of the system and structures in place, we don't have the supports necessary to see them all the way through. And one of the biggest barriers is the licensure exams mm. and assessments that they have to take in order to be able to get licensed. So if we don't do something different, we're going to continue to have the same results year over year, which is what we've been experiencing. So that brings me on to the study. Jason, once this study and report are complete, how would you hope to help diversify the pool of teachers in our state? Well, I mean, I think what we're what we're really envisioning is that we're going to be able to use both quantitative, administrative, and survey data uh, to, and also interview data to document uh, some of the phenomena that Dyrus was just talking about. So Dyrus is saying, we don't know how many people right now um, are not, are entering teacher preparation, but are not making it out. Well, that's one of the things that we hope to be able to document through the study. And uh, we don't we don't know right now how many people are attempting licensure exams, but uh, but not passing. We don't know how many people are passing, but are then uh, diverting from the pathway and not moving into classrooms. So part of what we hope to do is document, like be able to put real numbers uh, to those phenomena that I think you know we expect that we might find, um, and being able to put those numbers and also pair those numbers with learning about people's experiences, you know, through qualitative data interviews, understanding, you know, how people are experiencing these different stages. The hope is that it will point the state and point school districts uh, to, uh, to, to different strategies, uh, uh, point teacher preparation programs, um, you know, give us a, a more comprehensive sense. Because as Dyrese was saying before, it's not going to just be one thing, right? There's going to be, you need a diversity of strategies uh, to address this problem. And we're hoping that uh, being able to accumulate these facts and be able to document these experiences will help us uh, point towards the, the strategies that are going to be the most worthwhile. Okay, that is Dr. Jason Grissom with the Tennessee Education Research Alliance. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Dr. George, hang with us through the break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation about teacher diversity and talk with a new teacher and a teacher candidate about what led them to the profession. What do you think about teacher diversity in Tennessee? Tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. When I became a teacher, I was hit with the old saying, those who can't do, teach. That saying always irked me. Anyone who says that has almost certainly never taught a class. You have to become master of crowd control, a part-time therapist. Sometimes you're a nurse. Other times you're a conflict resolution expert. You're a sounding board for questions that students dare not ask their parents. You're a coach or fill-in player for any game or sport, a part-time comedian, oh, and you have to teach lessons that ensure the growth and development of young people. So yeah, they can take that old saying and shove it. Life is not easy for teachers, but it can prove to be tremendously rewarding when a former student grows to their fullest potential. 
So, that aside, hopefully my next guests are not deterred by that intro. I'd like to introduce Sheila Hubbard, former paraprofessional turned teacher, and Cicela Hernandez, who is currently a teacher candidate at Lipscomb University. Sheila, Cicela, welcome to This is Nashville. Now, you know, Sheila, I know you're in the middle of a class right now. Talk about giving a lot of effort. Let's start with you. Can you briefly walk us through your path to becoming a teacher? Um, well, I started off, it's nice to be here. I thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. I started off as a paraprofessional and I had, was a paraprofessional for 13 years. And then I went back to school and became a teacher. Um, That's I worked full time and um, became a teacher. What was it like being a paraprofessional for 13 years? Um, I would say it was it was a wonderful learning experience. It helped uh, to prepare me for where I am now. Uh, if I hadn't had that, I don't know if I'd be doing this well as I did now, but it opened my eyes to a need of more diversity in the classroom. So I appreciate my experience as a paraprofessional as well. What what grade what grade levels are you teaching? I work with pre-K. Oh, that's a lot of fun. And that very busy job right there. What are some of your favorite parts about this? Oh, my, fa I guess my favorite parts is, um, is the children and building those relationships, uh, within the, um, with the families and getting to know the families and stuff, uh, here in pre-K, I get the opportunity to learn a lot about my families and where they come from and all about their needs and different things so that I can be, at, um, uh, accessible to them for whatever they're needing at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, Cicela, I understand you're currently a student teacher, right? Yes, I am. What led you to pursue becoming a teacher? Um, well, when I was in sophomore year of high school, I was part of a program called El Protector uh, with Metro Na uh, Nashville Police Department. And it's a program that focuses on like Hispanic Latino um, communities, especially with younger children um, and just getting to know them, working with them. Um, and so I was part of that program and I realized um, how neat it was to feed into younger children. Um, it was the first time I had ever worked with the youth. Um, so that sparked that interest in me um, when I was in high school. Are you enjoying being a student teacher? How's it going so far? So far, it's been great. I love the school where I'm at right now. Um, the students have been very welcoming. So it's been very, very nice to be with them every single day and um, build those relationships. Now, Dr. Diarese George from the Tennessee Educators Color Educators of Color Alliance is still with us. Dr. George, you know, I understand you're not in the classroom anymore, but, you know, tell us, how did you become a teacher? Um, I used to mentor uh, on the weekends when I was working in corporate sales, uh, uh, a program for black and brown boys in the community that I live in. And a lot of my friends happened to be teachers. And as I was trying to climb the corporate ladder, uh, many of my friends were like, man, you, you're really good at, at, at mentoring. You should consider teaching. And at the time, I think I was chasing all of the uh, things that, you know, get a great job, try to get a great salary. I ended up chasing after those things and became miserable. Long story short, um, I realized that I love working. Like I was, I was, I was living my Monday to Friday to get to the weekends where I could be around the boys that I was mentoring. Mm. And so, um, I decided that, uh, I, I no longer wanted to be, have a great job with money and be miserable. I'd rather do something that I love. So I made a career change and became a teacher and had the opportunity to teach in the district that I grew up in, um, for six years. Okay. I, I have an experience. Okay. I have to ask all of you, you know, if any of you have had a person of color as a teacher when you were in school, Sheila? I'm sorry, could you tell me that question one more time? Did you have, when you were in school, did you have any teachers who were a person of color? I actually did, and I was excited. It turned out to be my fifth grade teacher. I started off in a rural area school, so I didn't see much of myself, but when, I, when that school closed down and I ended up going to school in town, I got to meet my very first teacher, that was my teacher of color and I loved her and I still reach out to her and I cried when I had to leave her class. Wow. Wow. How, how important was it for you? It sounds like it was very emotional and important to you, but 
you know, talk to me a little bit about how your your mind state shifted a little bit being in fifth grade, finally seeing someone who looked like you lead the classroom. My mind shifted because I knew that I looked up to her and I wanted to be like her when I grew up. Um, she expected the best out of us, not just um, just my race or anything, but she expected the best out of uh, of, of, of her entire class. So um, she pushed us. And she didn't have any problems with getting in touch with our moms if we weren't doing up to par like we she felt like we should be doing or whatever. But she expected the best out of us. And I strive for the best ever since I had had her in class. Mm -hmm. Now, Cicela, did you have any teachers who looked like you growing up? I never had a Latina or Latino teacher um, in school, I only had a um, black teacher in eighth grade. Eighth grade. Oh, so out of your entire school career, only one teacher in eighth grade. Yes. Wow. How difficult was that for you and your family? Um, obviously, when I was younger, um, because my parents did not speak English. Um, it was very hard to um, have that relationship with teachers in my parents. Um, a lot of times my parents missed out on um, those parent and teacher conferences because we did not have access to a translator or they weren't part of like a program um, that where parents got to help out. Um, so for sure, that was the the biggest struggle for my parents. And I think a lot of times they felt like they didn't know what they were doing and they really wanted to help me support me in school. If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville and I'm your host, Khalil e. Colonna. We're talking this hour about teacher diversity in Tennessee with three people looking to increase diversity in the profession. Now, you know, Sheila, Sheila and Cicela, you're both working with students right now on a daily basis. I wonder if you two have had any interactions with a student that really appreciates the fact that they can see themselves in you. Cicela? Yeah, so I'm actually with um, a high school group and um, a lot of my students that are native Spanish speakers, they tend to they're like it's like a magnet right mm. um, we're all you know latinos and it's it's like we click um not saying that i don't click with the other students but it's just a special connection with them because i understand that your parents have to work late like i understand your struggle um so having that connection with them has been very um fun and i feel like you know if i continue to be in the same route that yeah, hopefully i can pour in more and get them motivated that there is more options outside of high school how about you sheila is sheila with us well, I'm yes I'm here yes sir um just the other day we were talking about professions and we were showing um, we do a college every week and um, this week was Fisk and it showed up different teachers and it's like that that's a teacher like Miss Hubbard and I was like and you guys can be a teacher as well someday and all you got to do is study hard and keep your mind stayed on it you can be a teacher too uh, someday and so during center play I heard them over there I'm the teacher no I'm the teacher no I'm the teacher so I'm glad to be able to being them post that you know planted that little seed within them that they can be a teacher as well and outside of being a teacher i used to be a cheer coach as well mm. so i'm proud to say that some of my girls that you that used to cheer for me they saw when i went back to school and they was like well if miss hubbard can do it we can do it too and so one of the young ladies she graduated a few months after i got my master's degree in education and so when she reached out she asked questions or whatever so i'm glad that I, she looked up to me and is using me as a mentor to help her when she has questions in the classroom she is teaching this year so i'm proud of her for that mm -hmm. now Cicela, I want to go back to something you said earlier about never having a Latina or Latino teacher. Did you ever have one later in your education, college? No, I actually uh, went, I go to a predominantly white university. Um, so I've never had a higher education uh, teacher that is a, of color. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that I've been misrepresented in school, for sure. Now, in, in the last segment, we had Dr. George mentioned that 
sometimes teachers, when you're the only teacher of color, you can be burdened with extra responsibilities and things. Dr. George, you know, Cicela is about to become an educator and going into the world, stepping into her own classroom. What words of advice do you have for her as, as how to best navigate showing up for her students, showing up for the school, but also being able to show up for herself? Absolutely. Um, I know Cicela well, and I I will tell her to continue to show up authentically and unapologetically as, as she is and who she is, but also protect and guard her joy at any cost necessary. Um, that We've already had conversations about some of these things that, that could be waiting for her and, and are actually uh, some of the impetus of burnout and pushing her out and positioning her to be in a position to push back on those very things, um, not getting in a position to where, you know, you know, um, you have to uh, absorb, you know, um, as much as you love your students, but consistently having to absorb the the most challenging students, uh, being in a position where you're um, asked to translate both uh, written and also verbally in those situations, things that, you know, you might be excited to do it initially, but, you know, constantly having to do it, which takes away time for you to be able to plan and support your students uh, could lead to burnout and could lead to you putting in a position where you contemplate what your future looks like. And that may not be in education. So those two things show up as your authentic self unapologetically, but guard your peace and joy immensely and intensely um, uh, against the burdens and also the barriers that could be pushing you out of the profession. In the last segment, we were talking about the new study that's now underway through the Tennessee Education Research Alliance. Cicela, what would you like to see happen from that study? Well, I hope to see that uh, people take an importance um, out of it, um, for it to get noticed, not just among the community, but outside of the community, um, and get more resources to get teachers into classrooms that are of color. Um, so that's that's the outcome I want to see for sure. Sheila, tell me this. You know, what do you think it would take for us to have more teachers of color in Tennessee? What would you, how would you like to see this play out? I... I think just, you know, showing more appreciation um, for teachers and all that we do, um, not seeing us as maybe a, a, a babysitter or whatever, but, you know, just getting more involved and just come into the classroom and see what all we, we do so that you can do that and you can see what actually goes on and takes place in the classroom and just showing excitement towards teaching and just, like I said, just being appreciative of what all we do um, and being a part of it. Anything else you think people misunderstand about teachers? I mean, the ed education and being a teacher has been highly politicized over the past couple of years. What are we not getting? Um, like I said, you got to come to the classroom. Um, we welcome anyone into our classroom just to come see what's going on and what's taking place in the classroom. Um, we do a lot more than people, I, I think, they, than they realize. So um, if they take the time and just come see, hey, maybe they'll understand where we're coming from, put themselves in our shoes. Now, Cicela, tell me, you're about to, you're in your last semester, correct? Yes. Okay. You're about to have your own classroom in charge. What are you looking most forward to? Um, I think for the first time, I'm ready to take charge of my own classroom and be me, not be the person that my mentor teacher is. I just, I want to develop my own character in that. And I've seen it a little bit this semester when I've had the opportunity to teach all day. Um, you know, a lot of my, you know, jokes that I do that I don't realize that I make sometimes like, you know, um, but I just want to be, have that freedom, that liberty to be me. So Sheila, do you have any advice? For Cicela? I think she's on the right track. I came in, Cecilia, Cicela, when I was, um, my first year was during COVID. So mm. I got to actually get in and be myself. It's okay to listen to what others say, 
but you've got to find your own way and um, just be yourself in the classroom. Don't be afraid to ask questions. If you um, if you don't understand, they know that you're coming out and I'm always here for you if you need my, me to help you with anything. I really appreciate having you all onto the show as a former educator myself. I appreciate everything that you all are doing. And to all educators out there, keep on going because the youth depends on it. We had our guest. That was Sheila Hubbard. She's a former power professional turned teacher. She was joined by student teacher Cicela and Dr. George Di Diaries George with the Tennessee Educators of Color Alliance. Thank you all so much for being here with us. Really, really appreciate it. We want to thank everyone who tuned in this hour. Tomorrow's Friday, y'all, so what better day of the week to talk about food? Are you in the mood for wings? We can take a taste test of the best wing spots in town, so tune in. This is Nashville is a production of WPLN News and Nashville Public Radio. Listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Our producers are Steve Harush and Rose Gilbert. Our digital lead is Anna Gallegos Cannon. Michaela Elias is our technical director. Our executive producer is Andrea Tuthope. The masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. Special thanks to our digital producer this week, Cindy Abrams. The conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. Find us on Instagram and tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil A. Colonna. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. And be good to each other.